Drones. When you hear the word drone, what images come to your mind? Amazon. Amazon. Is it military? Would it be war? Something like this? A predator? Or something like this? A small quadcopter? Like I have here. Or maybe even a small phone fixed wing. These are all called drones, but they also go by many other names. Unmanned aerial vehicle, unmanned aircraft systems, remotely piloted aircraft systems, radio controlled aircraft. There's a lot of names for them, a lot of acronyms. But they all kind of refer to the same general technology as of recent. When you hear people talk about RC aircraft, radio controlled aircraft, as many of you have known someone or flown them yourself because they've been around for decades. And usually you'll see someone with a uh, radio controller and a long antenna on 72 megahertz and they'll be flying their foam airplane around in circles. So what's changed? And why should we care? Today we're gonna to talk about what's happening specifically here in Hawaii, because that's where most of us live, where I'm from, and it's the place we care about. And I wanna kinda of convey what is happening here in our, in our home with regards to uh, drones and what we're using them for. And so, one of the most popular uses for drones right now is in aerial photography, filmmaking, and 2D mapping. Traditionally, this is done with manned aircraft, such as a helicopter or a fixed-wing airplane, and these can be pretty expensive uh, to acquire and fly. But nowadays, with an inexpensive quad rotor like this on my uh, left here, you can acquire an image like this off the coast of Maui. And this is someone that just went out there, a local photographer on his kayak, launched his quadcopter right off of the kayak, and he just sat there and waited until the whale actually came up to him. And these are the types of views that you can now attain very inexpensively because these are 100% electric power. They don't cost fuel. You don't spend thousands of dollars an hour to operate them. And they're giving filmmakers this new tool to capture this unique perspective that is now being described as the drone perspective. And you'll find hundreds of YouTube videos. In fact, there's some great websites out there with interactive maps that just showcase drone footage from around the world that people have been collecting with their either the hobbyist or more professional grade um, aircraft. And what's really allowed this explosion of popularity for, um, for consumers is in part thanks to Amazon. You can find a DJI Phantom on Amazon and many other retailers for around $1,000. And once you have one, it costs you practically nothing to fly and capture these amazing views. But what's, what's really caused all of this? Why has this all happened in the last few years? Why not decades ago? And the answer is to another technology that most of you have in your pocket right now. And that would be your smartphone. And because the same sensors that you find in your smartphone, such as the accelerometer, the gyroscope, your miniature GPS, all of these things are now being ma mass manufactured in China on a massive scale. And this has dramatically brought down the prices. And what that has done is it's spurred new innovations in other areas. And for one example is RC aircraft, and now we call them drones. And what we're really talking about when we're talking about UAVs is that they're a little bit smarter than your traditional RC aircraft because they have something magical. They have something called a flight controller board, also known as the autopilot. And that's on this guy right here, this is the flight controller board. And the flight controller board is where the software is basically allowing you to do semi-autonomous to sometimes fully autonomous operations with the drone. And it makes it very easy to fly. Traditionally, you would go and join an RC aircraft club and you would take you know, months and months of practicing. With the DJI Phantom, for example, most people can have it up and running in a day and they'll be able to take to the skies. And this is directly correlated to um, the explosion of smartphones. And so at the heart of these aircraft is the same components we're mostly familiar with when you're talking about radio controlled aircraft. You still have your motors, your props, your ESCs. It's powered by lithium polymer batteries, 100% electric. But what's where the magic is, is, is really in the, in the autopilot because that's the, the brain of the, of the drone. And with the miniaturization of so many different sensors, it's allowing us to apply them to new applications. And so 
you guys heard Jason talk about using different cameras with telescopes. We're doing the same thing with drones. We put on different cameras for different applications. And one of the applications is in aerial mapping. And so in uh, January uh, this year, um, I was sent to the Philippines with a, a UH research team. We went to the island of Panay, which was hit pretty hard by uh, Typhoon Yolanda, uh, internationally known as Haiyan. And the idea was to use inexpensive aircraft to capture the extent of the damage and to show that it doesn't cost millions of dollars to get real-time information. We can now do this in the field. You can have your aircraft in the back of a pickup truck and two guys can go out there and start doing aerial assessments and get that information as quickly as possible to those that need it. And the focus of our particular mission for this, uh, for this case was on the Aklan River, which uh, flooded and did a considerable damage to a number of villages in the local area. It also flooded the uh, agriculture, especially rice fields, which caused a major shortage of rice. And so we were trying to map out all of the different banks and uh, areas that were prone to flooding so that mitigation efforts can begin. And we did something a little different. We didn't take a bunch of tools with us to the Philippines. We actually took a bunch of parts to the Philippines and assembled everything in the field there. And this was done with everyday tools. And we assembled our, our foam aircraft and used off-the-shelf uh, consumer cameras to capture the aerial images. And some of you might be wondering, well, what's the benefit of that? What's so great about capturing pictures from the air? This is our research team, by the way. Uh, we work with the University of Auckland very closely and the uh, University of uh, Manila. Everywhere we went, we made sure that we explained to people what we were doing. And we wanted to make sure that they really understood why this was important to us, and hopefully to them. And so we would set up an FPV monitor. FPV stands for first person view. And it gives you a live video feed of what the aircraft is seeing as it's going. And so we would set this, these monitors up everywhere we went so that anyone from the local villages could come and kind of watch what we were doing and uh, see what the aircraft we were, where it was flying. And for a lot of these kids especially, they had never been on an airplane in their life. And so this was the first time they're seeing their home from a bird's eye perspective. So it was a really cool experience for them and for us. And the goal of our, our mission here was to collect aerial images so that we could stitch them together into a mosaic. And so this, you might think, is just one picture, but in fact it's made up of thousands of individual photos. And if you were to zoom in on any part of this mosaic, you would get a high resolution detailed image of that area. We can then take these images and use the GPS information um, from the onboard aircraft. We can ortho-rectify this to the terrain, which basically means we're correcting it for distortion, which allows it to be used as an actual map. We then can take that imagery and start gathering information from it. And so, for example, here we were looking at the town of Libakal and identifying all of the agriculture areas and also the levee system. And part of the levee system did fail during the, uh, the typhoon, which uh, began to flood part of the town. But this is an idea of quickly gathering images, putting them together, extracting information from them, and then handing it over to local first responders and disaster organizations. But let's bring it home now. So that was in the Philippines. But what's going on on this side? So here, at the university where I work, we are doing research on environmental monitoring. So in Kona, at the uh, Pukuvava Forest Reserve, we're trying to identify and locate endangered plants, such as the Willy Willy tree, that was devastated by the Gullah uh, many years ago. And the idea is that if we can know where the endangered plants are, we can help manage the habitat better and also track invasive species. We're also working with local farmers, trying to identify new ways of maybe detec detecting early disease and outbreaks. And it's great talking with people that see the value in drones because, for example, we're at Richard Haas Farm and he's immediately saying, well, we've got to start mounting things on there so we can you know, just deliver fertilizer and uh, all kinds of things like that. And this is really where the innovation comes from. It's just coming up with ideas. And everyone that just thinks of one thing they can do can lead to another idea. And so this is an example of something recent. Um, Hurricane Isel hit us in August. And Albizia trees were pretty devastating. 
and this map was done with just satellite imagery. But our current project is using satellite, updated satellite imagery with aerial imagery from UAVs and trying to get a more accurate picture of exactly where Albizia is so that in the future, the next hurricane that rolls through here, we'll know exactly what areas are most vulnerable and what needs to be done before that happens. And so the day after the storm, I live in Pune, by the way, I don't know. And so the day after the storm, I was out there with my, my quad rotor and taking some aerial images. This is the Kao Kahoa Road. It was completely shut off for most of that day. This is uh, Leilani. Some of the trees were falling over on houses and homes. It was a pretty common sight going through the different neighborhoods. And one thing I have to point out is that with manned aircraft, of course you can get great images. But what, we are, what makes drones unique is that you can have field teams doing it almost anywhere for very low cost. But also, most importantly, is you're actually mapping out the damage. So we're not just taking a photo from a helicopter and trying to remember where, this, where the damage happened. We're actually taking maps that can be used for geo-reference and then applied in the field. And this is Kapoho area. Kapoho suffered a lot of storm damage. And some of the houses were knocked back completely off the foundation. This was a home that was taken five to 10 yards off of its foundation. So one of the you know, most popular uses right now with aerial photography and mapping is having a great impact on what we're doing every day. But we're also doing things here that's gonna impact the future. And this is where autonomous systems come in. And before I go any further, how many of you own a Roomba or some kind of robotic home cleaning robot? Some of you, okay. So, do you actually control the Roomba when it's vacuuming your house? Or do you let it do its thing? You let it do its thing. And that's where drones are starting to head. And right now, it still requires you know, manual intervention by a pilot and a crew. But in the future, you're gonna have fully autonomous UAVs flying around doing different things. For example, infrastructure inspection. One thing, they might be attached to a bridge, and after an earthquake, you need to see how badly damaged the bridge is. So it uh, launches the drone, it films the bridge, that information is being back to the engineer's office and you can determine if traffic can now flow on the bridge. Or you can do the same thing with wildfires in the middle of a forest. There's a lot of different applications for having these remote sites. But it's important to point out that the technology is still not quite there. It's, it's semi-autonomous and in some cases it can be fully autonomous, but it's still, especially with regulations, it requires a pilot to always be in control. And one of the big challenges to this is the navigation capabilities of the robot. And so what we're working with is we call this SLAM. It stands for Simultaneous Localization and Mapping. What it basically means though is that you're trying to map out an area without relying completely on GPS. And so if you imagine in the future, a first responder could send a, a small quadcopter into a building that just collapsed. It could then map out the building on its own. You wouldn't have to have a pilot completely controlling it the entire time. And these, these autonomous operations are really going to open up an entirely new area of applications. And this is where we're really excited about seeing how we can have a huge impact on, on the future. And it's just a few more years away that we're expecting to have autonomous cars. But I believe that maybe even sooner than that, we can have completely autonomous UAVs doing things that we call the 3Ds, dull, dirty, and dangerous. It's things that you normally don't want humans doing because we have short attention spans and we get bored or we just don't want to do it because it's too dangerous. Those are the different things that a UAV can really help us solve. And so one last thing is that a lot of these things that I'm talking about are not taking place in some distant state or country. It's all happening here in Hawaii, especially on this island. And we are a part of a pan-Pacific test range that the FAA has designated. And basically what we're doing is we're trying to show that drones can be safely integrated into the national airspace and used for a number of different applications. But what I'm talking about right now is just the beginning because 10 years from now, the next generation is going to come up with a lot better ideas than we can. And there's going to be uses for them that we couldn't even think of. And that's really where I'm excited about our future. Thank you very much.